Hi, engineers. In this video today, we're going to be talking about wound healing. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Comment down below and don't forget to subscribe here to Niche Nerd Nursing. And then check out nichenerd.org. That's where we have all the notes and illustrations for all the lectures here and from Ninja Nerd that we put up for you guys to use and study from. And we hope it really helps. So let's get started with wound healing here. What we're talking about here is the skin and how when we have a wound that is within our body that is caused within our skin, right? And how does it heal naturally through itself and also from us helping it as well. So us as the nurses, we're gonna be at bedside. We may have patients that have gone through surgery, have gone through traumas, have had something else go on within their life, and they have wounds that we have to help facilitate healing. So I think it's really important for us to understand how the wound can repair itself and also how we can intervene and also help. So with different wounds, right, we wanna remember that there is an opening from, or a, a, an opening that is causing our barrier, our natural barrier to the outside world, our skin, that exposes you know, our insides out, right, or allows outside to come in. And when we do that, we are exposing things like, if it's really um, at the top, superficial, it's our epidermis, our dermis, our hypodermis, and then we can go into our subcutaneous and then our bone and our muscle, right? So when we have wound repair, meaning when our wounds are able to heal, there's a couple different ways that we can help. And there's three different intentions that we can do. We can do primary, secondary, or tertiary intention, right? And what does that mean? That means we can have the first intention, which is where we have some type of approximation of the skin. So this skin here was either cut very, very cleanly, and we are able to approximate or bring these edges together really nicely. Right, so this is edge to edge healing. So this will typically leave a minimal, a minimal scar as we can see right here. Over time it'll heal and it'll look really, really nice because we wanna think about how these are uh, edges of the skin are able to be brought together really nicely. And when they do that, all that healing process here, all those sutures and those stitches or those staples holding them together is going to allow the healing process to occur in a very, very small area, right? So let's move in here to our second intention. And our second intention is now we have edges that maybe aren't able to be approximated as nicely, or we have something that is not gonna be able to be closed as we would like to. So because of that, we're going to have this healing that is going to occur from inside out, which is important because we want to make sure that we aren't trapping anything inside our body, right? Because we don't want to create a pocket of bacteria that on the surface we have this nice closed wound, but on the underneath we have a pocket of bacteria that's just festering and growing and growing, and then we have an abscess or something else serious along the lines of the healing process. So we are healing here from inside out with our secondary intention, right? And what we're looking at is it's an after typically a large injury. So maybe this is a giant um, pressure ulcer that is trying to heal or uh, something else that's going on just taking out a big gouge of the skin and we are able to just let this heal. This is also gonna be just uh, abrasions or um, secondary degree wounds that are just trying to heal, but there's nothing that we can put so we might start thinking about other types of interventions like little grafts or the type of wound care we can give it to keep it moist. But overall, this is not edge to edge. This is inside out healing. And then tertiary intention is our intention, meaning we're gonna leave this open on purpose, right? And that has to do again with what I was talking about is we don't want to create a pocket of bacteria underneath the skin. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave this open and allow that to heal from the out or the inside out. So we're gonna push all that bacteria. This is going to be something like a dog bite or a cat bite or any type of puncture wound that's gonna be deep within the skin. But we're also gonna have this patient get um, lots of uh, possibly a wound vac. They may be getting uh, cleaning daily debridements or every other day debridements in order to make sure that that is really cleaned out. So these are also going to be some type of deep injury. Okay. And we want to make sure that we are um, getting it to a point that maybe we can help close later. So what we're talking about here is primary, <clears throat> secondary, and tertiary intention. And then we can talk about the result. So as these heal, if we have primary intention, it's usually a nice, really thin scar, right? A surgical scar. Maybe it has a couple little marks, a little small marks here from sutures or staples. 
Secondary intention is going to look a little more uh, pulled. You're going to see that striation maybe a little bit in the scar, maybe a keloid or two that is formed. And then the third could be very, very big and open. Or when we are able to close it and approximate it, it could start to look like secondary as well because now we're going to have some healing that we're going to able to at least get a little closer together. And then we're going to have this mishmash of first degree and tertiary or primary and tertiary intention mixing together. So now that we understand how we can have the wound be repaired, let's talk about all of the uh, complications and the process that we go through when we do have an injury and how we get to the point of healing and then keeping this patient stable. All right, engineers, now we're gonna be talking about the phases of wound healing. And what we're looking at here is how our body goes through from injury to heal itself, right? So we first have the injury, right? The injury occurs, the patient gets stabbed, the patient gets uh, burned by something, and all of a sudden we have our first phase immediately starting. So immediately we jump into this first phase. What is that first phase? That is hemostasis. So what does that mean? We have a cut, right? The cut goes into our body and it starts to disrupt and damage all those blood vessels. Those blood vessels then will start to what? We start to bleed, right? So as we start bleeding, our body doesn't want this to happen, right? We want to keep all the blood that we have in, in. So we start to get a response of vasoconstriction, that constricting then of our blood vessels. As that constriction occurs of the blood vessels, we then get some platelets starting to aggregate, right? And they start to form our blood clot here, right? So as the platelet plug forms, and we eventually get our clot, right? And the whole point of this is for what? The whole goal is to go from bleeding to not bleeding. So now that bleeding has stopped, we can then move into our next phase. All right, engineers, now we're into phase two here of wound healing and we're going into inflammatory. So hemostasis has stopped, it's, its phase is over, right? Bleeding has stopped, we have a clot, and now we're gonna immediately move into the inflammatory stage. And, we, stage. and the inflammatory stage can last for a couple days, right? So it's gonna be a couple days after the injury. And we're gonna have lots of things going on here, but I'm gonna try to break it down to something uh, very simple. So we first wanna think about what was going on previously. We had the constriction of the blood vessels, we had the clot form, now our vessels are gonna start to dilate back a little bit, right? When they dilate, right, or vasodilate, we are going to have some leakage, right? And that leaky vessel, because it becomes more permeable, is going to increase that swelling, right? So the first thing in the inflammatory stage is inflammation, right? That makes sense. Along with the inflammation that we get, is pain, right? With that inflammation, the patient is going to experience pain as shown by these lightning bolts here. And then we also are going to have a scab that starts to form as well. So with the inflammation, with the pain, with the scab, you can also note some heat from the area or some redness, right? And all that has to do with the underlying uh, work that's going on with our skin. So if we look over here, we have two things that I wanted to identify. The first here is our macrophage. So what happens is we have this injury occur and the macrophage comes along and it starts to see all this debris in here. So it's gonna go and it's gonna take out the trash. Right? As it takes out the trash, it's going to drop off growth factor here. So we have this growth factor that it drops off, which is great. Because what the growth factor does is it puts up its flag and it says, hey, fibroblasts, why don't you come on over? And fibroblasts are important to come to the area because they are going to help us with the next phase. So let's think about this again. We have an injury, all of these inflammatory responses start. We have inflammation, we get pain, we get a scab that can form, we get healing or heat, we get redness all of that within the area of the skin, right? It should be with localized to that injury. Because of that, macrophages come and the white blood cells come, right? They're going to help fight this infection. The macrophage is gonna come, it's gonna take out all the trash, get all this deb debris out, and it's gonna drop off that growth factor. That growth factor is going to signal 
to the fibroblast and say, hey, why don't you come on over here? We're gonna need your help too. So we go to the proliferation stage and the proliferation stage is now where we have this scab that's really nice, right? This one can take anywhere from weeks to months. It depends again on the injury and the depths and everything else that's going on with the patient. Are they able to heal, et cetera, et cetera. But the fibroblasts come and you can see them here as these little green stars. The fibroblasts are coming and they are going to drop off collagen. And collagen is really nice and important for us because it's going to allow us to start to generate some tissue in here, right? It is going to also help close up this wound. So really important for fibroblasts is they bring us, oh, let's do it in purple because it was purple there. They're gonna bring us collagen, right? And that's going to help not only proliferate, meaning create some new skin in there, granulized skin, but it's also going to help close up that wound. So it's really important for oxygen to play a role in here because we want some oxygenation to come to this area in order for us to get new cell growth. Then as the, the wound is healing, we go into the maturation. So as that collagen has been deposited, we have that granular tissue that is formed, right? And this can be years because now the wound is fully closed, right? Months to years. The wound is fully closed, but we have that new scar that's there. Well, the collagen that's within is able to help close and pull that together, right? So as it, it's pulling and tightening, it's able to cause a nice, hopefully smaller scar and help that skin be a little tougher. Because this is new skin, it's a little weaker. It's not gonna be able to um, be a hold up to any type of area that's around it. Like the skin around it's a lot stronger than that scar. So this collagen is gonna help, you know, create a little more tension and create a little more strength within that new skin that's developed. So that is how wound healing occurs in a, the very simplest form. Now let's go over to what would cause some barriers for a patient to heal and also complications that they could get from some type of wound. All right, engineers, now let's talk about the barriers for a patient to be healing their wounds. So we're gonna go through and talk about a bunch of these really quickly. One of them is when we use the Braden scale for, right? The Braden scale is for detection of someone developing a pressure injury. And one of the key components of pressure injuries is the unrelieved pressure, right? So a patient that has unrelieved pressure. And what is the root cause of that? I want you to think even further. It's not just the pressure. What is the component because of the pressure? that is causing that barrier. And that's the decreased oxygen, right? Or the decreased blood flow to that area. Moving on here, we have somebody who we're gonna check their skin trigger, right? Where you're gonna pinch on that knuckle. So a barrier for this patient is either dehydration or overhydration. You're gonna say, wait, why is it both? Well, let's think about it. If you're dehydrated, you're not getting the circulatory volume, right, of the blood going through the body. So very similar, if we have decreased blood flow to the area, we're gonna have decreased transmission of the nutrients and the debris and the oxygen. And overhydration is the same thing. If, it's, if the patient's overhydrated, they're fluid filled, we're gonna have a decrease in blood flow to that area as well. Moving on to here, this one's nice. I'm sure everyone's experienced this before. This is a nice open, uh, stage two blister right here on the back of your heel, right on your Achilles tendon. Probably got it from a new pair of cleats or shoes, right? And that's not gonna heal if you're playing in a tournament over the weekend, so repeat trauma to the area, right? So when you have repeat trauma to an area, you have a little area, maybe a blister, you played a soccer tournament, not that I'm speaking from experience, but you play in a soccer tournament over the weekend and then you have this blister and then you had a day or two off and you go and you put those cleats back on, you run out in the field and you're like, Duck, this blister, it's opening again. It's because you have repeat trauma, right? That area wasn't able to heal. Now we're gonna introduce some more trauma and again, we're gonna have an opening that's not gonna heal. So there's another barrier. Here's somebody who is already obviously over, um, overhydrated or fluid filled, right? And they have an ulcer, so it's not healing. They're already overhydrated, they got edema in that area. But there's some other things going on in that wound as well. One of those is infection, right? If a patient has an infection going on, or we can even say bacteria in the area, right? That is going to 
decrease the healing. The patient could also have necrosis, right? They have that decreased oxygen supply to the wound, so now they're gonna have necrotic material. That's gonna be hard to heal. And there can also be a biofilm that develops, right? And then we talked about that in other videos where the biofilm pr prevents the wound from healing correctly because it's cutting off, again, oxygen supply and the ability for that skin to heal. Then we have patients that might also have systemic factors. And what I mean by that is it's, these are things that are maybe a little bit harder to control, um, but we're gonna talk about them as well. One of them is just age. So right here, we have a baby bottle, age. Those that are really young or really old, they will have compromised healing. A patient who has some type of respiratory or cardiac disease, right, and that comes back again to the blood flow, right, to the issue of transferring oxygen to the area. So if they have any type of underlying condition, that can also decrease their wound healing as well. Also nutrition. Right now, some people have the ability to control it and they just don't. But nutrition can also play an issue. Again, we talked about this before, where a patient might be NPO, so they're gonna have a decrease in the ability to eat or get the nutrients that they need. Maybe they had some type of intense jaw injury, so now they're only gonna be able to have liquids, clear liquids through the jaw, right? Because the jaw's all soon shut. So again, these are factors that we can maybe help a little bit, but not much. We can't really help modify this too much. And then we also have here, any type of medication that they might be on that might cause some barrier, right? So if they are on some type of immunosuppression medication as well, or they are immunocompromised. Immunocompromised. All right, so we talked about some barriers, right? Let's talk about some complications. And you're gonna be like, well, that is kind of a barrier. Yeah, we, they kind of coincide. So some complications, again, would be infection. And when we talk about infection, you also wanna think about other things that be going on within that wound. So think about all the different types of staph the patient can get, right? Or we can also talk about uh, the bacteria or the antibiotics that they were on. Those antibiotics that they were on maybe didn't correctly help uh, that patient, right? So now the bacteria that was not, it failed to treat, is now coming back. So it's getting even worse, right? So infection is one. We can think staph or a failed to treat. If you've never heard that before, failed to treat means we give the patient um, <clears throat> some type of antibiotic that we believe is going to fix whatever's going on with them, because most of the time that is the proven choice to use. And then what happens is that doesn't treat exactly what's going on with them. Happens commonly in like UTIs um, when we think we know exactly what type of bacteria they have. Moving on, another complication, we talked about it a little bit, is that decrease in blood. So if a patient is actively hemorrhaging, right, and that doesn't have to be outward, they could be having some type of GI bleed, well, that is also gonna cause some issues with healing, right? And then we have the two down here that the NCLEX always likes to hit on. They, they ask this question all the time, right? The first one is we have a wound heal here that is healing and then it starts to open, right? And the word that we use for that is dehiscence. So this wound is starting to open up. It is not exposing anything, but maybe some under, underlying materials but we're gonna hopefully be able to get that cleaned up, get that sutured back up, and then we'll be okay. This is our medical emergency here, and this is our evisceration. Right. And what we're looking at here is we have a patient who had a wound that dehisced, and then eventually organs came out. And when these organs come out, we've talked about this before in videos where it's a medical emergency, and we need to make sure that we can get that back in and do it properly in order so that the patient doesn't have an ischemic bowel along with any other issues. So I hope this video made sense. I hope you understand now how our body heals and how we also can he help heal our patient as well. And as always, until next time.